Hi, and welcome to So Many Gospels, the first session of Within the Shadow of the Galilean. During this session, we will be looking at the many Gospels of early Christianity. Let's begin with a little trivia. When did the 27 books we find in the New Testament today become accepted by the Christian Church? You have some different choices. A. 367, B, 393, C, 397, D, 1549, or E, 1565. Congratulations! You're right! The tricky word in the question is accepted. The first known list of the 27 books currently in the New Testament, and only those books we have in the New Testament now, was in a Christmas letter sent out by a bishop named Athanasius, who lived in Alexandria, Egypt, in 367 to the congregations under his care. 26 years later, in 393, a number of bishops from around the Roman Empire held a council in Hippo, a coastal city in present-day Algeria, Africa. They collectively agreed on the list of books that were found in the Christmas letter of Athanasius as the books to be used by their Christian churches. The list of 27 books was then approved at a Council of Corinth, a coastal city in present-day Tunisia, Africa, in 397. Finally, the books of the New Testament were entered into Roman Catholic Church law at the Canon of Trent, a city in Italy, in 1549. Protestant denominations followed the example of of the Catholic Church, beginning with the Church of England in 1563. The development of the New Testament has a long history, a longer one than you may have thought. There was significant agreement by most of Christianity about how many books should be in the New Testament by the time Athanasius wrote his Christmas letter. But there was no need to officially close what is called the canon of the New Testament until 1549, 32 years after the Protestant Reformation began. While the Catholic and Protestant New Testament have the same books in them, some Protestant reformers considered leaving a few of the New Testament books out of their New Testament, most notably the book of James and Revelation. However, the Protestants did drop some of the books of the Old Testament that are still in the Catholic Old Testament. We will be looking at Gospels in four different categories, beginning with two Gospels that are known as infancy Gospels. There must have been a lot of interest in what happened between Jesus' birth and when he appears in the temple when he is 12 years old. The infancy gospel of Thomas tries to fill that gap. Written toward the end of the second century, it is a collection of stories about Jesus when he was a child. One tells of a five-year-old Jesus shaping 12 sparrows out of clay. When Jesus was about to get in trouble because he did this on the Sabbath, he clapped his hands and shouted, Be off and fly away. Remember, I brought you alive now. The gospel continues with 16 stories. The last story is similar to the story of Jesus appearing in the temple when he is 12 in the gospel of Luke. Another infancy gospel, the infancy gospel of James, is also interesting. However, it is not about Jesus. It is about Mary's life up till she gives birth to Jesus. So yeah, people must have been interested in the 
life of Mary before she gave birth to Jesus. We meet Mary's mother, who is a virgin, when she gives birth to Mary in the infancy gospel of James. Eventually, Mary is whisked away to the temple in Jerusalem, where she meets the parents of John the Baptist. There she remains a virgin until an old man named Joseph is about to be chosen by Lot to take her as his wife when she is 12. After many stories about Mary and Joseph, at the end of the Gospel, Mary is alone and gives birth to Jesus. Joseph, as he is returning home, is told that she still remained a virgin. The next set of Gospels we will look at were all found in a cave close to the Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi and are called Gnostic Gospels. Gnostic Gospels emphasize Jesus' divinity to the exclusion or almost to the exclusion of Jesus' humanity. Let's begin by telling the story of their discovery. In 1946, an Egyptian farmer named Muhammad Ali and his brother were digging for fertilizer in a cave near Nag Hammadi. As they were digging, they hit an earthen jar that contained several ancient books with 49 writings, including three Gnostic Gospels. We will discover, discuss here and a fourth we will discuss later. Together, the 49 writings that we currently have from the discovery are called the Nag Hammadi Library. All of the writings are from the 4th century, but they are all copies of earlier writings from the 2nd and 3rd century. The first gospel we will look at is called the Gospel of Truth. It says the world was not created by the supreme God, but by lower divine beings called eons, from the Greek word for thought. Eons, out of ignorance, created the physical world as a place to imprison human souls. Jesus is a divine being sent to remove ignorance from humans and the eons by bringing the truth and restoring union with the Supreme God. Jesus corrects the error of the eons' creation of the physical world. It is written before 180 and was known in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. Our second gospel we will look at is known as the Gospel of Philip. It is written between 150 and 350. Much of the Gospel of Philip is concerned with the origin and nature of physical human beings and how the sacraments of baptism and marriage are ways human beings become spiritual beings. Jesus' purpose was to free us from our physical bodies that imprison us into spiritual bodies that set us free. If you are familiar with David Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code, you may remember that the Gospel of Philip makes an appearance in the novel as he references it to claim that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married. The significant passages are these. There were three who always walked with the Lord, Mary his mother and Mary's sister, and Magdalene, the one who was called his companion. Later in the Gospel, it talked about Jesus and Mary Magdalene's relationship. The wisdom who is called the barren is the mother of, of the angels. And the companion of, we can't read that word, Mary Magdalene, P, 
period. Blank loved her more than all the other disciples and used to kiss her often on her blank. The rest of the disciples, some words are missing. They say to him, why do you love her more than all of these? How this fits into the context of the Gospel of Philip is hard to know, and any effort to apply this to the quest of the Jesus of history is speculation, especially given the context of the Gospel and the date it was written. What we do know is that the Gospel of Philip, like the Gospel of Truth, was well known in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. The third Gnostic Gospel we will look at is known as the Gospel of the Egyptians, or the Holy Book of the Great Spirit that is invisible. In it, an eon named Seth becomes incarnate in the adult human Jesus of Nazareth in order to release people's souls from the evil prison of this physical world. This brief look at the three Gnostic Gospels does not tell us much about their content. It does show us their emphasis on the divinity of Christ. They were written in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, which was used to thinking of royalty being divine. As Christianity began to develop in the eastern portion of the Roman Empire, they used that language of divine kingship in relationship to Jesus. This may not help us find the Jesus of history, but the Gnostic movement within Christianity played a significant role, although from a traditional Christianity, a negative one, in the debate about Jesus' divinity. The third group of Gospels are known as the Jewish Christian Gospels. These Gospels come from a group of pre-Christians that remain totally Jewish, these Jewish Christian groups were around at least through the 4th century and possibly beyond. They accepted Jesus as the Messiah for the Jews, but denied his virgin birth and Jesus' divinity. They practiced the Jewish Torah and the Jewish eating regulations and were strongly opposed to the congregations that were begun by Paul. They saw Paul as a traitor to the Jewish faith because he allowed non-Jews to be part and fully part of the communities he founded. There are possibly three Jewish Christian Gospels, the Gospel of the Ebionites, the Gospel of the Hebrews, and the Gospel of the Nazarenes, all were written sometime after 100 and before 200. The Jewish Christian gospel or gospels were probably written somewhere near Israel, representing some type of Jewish Christian community, possibly somewhere in Syria. The purpose of talking about these three groups of gospels is to highlight the diversity of the early pre-Christian movement along with the diversity of the Gospels they produced. Now we turn to the fourth group of Gospels. These Gospels that I would like to talk about are important, but are controversial. They are used by a small group of scholars questing for the Jesus of history most notably by progressive scholar Dominic Crossan. But they are seen as unreliable by the vast majority of scholars looking for the Jesus of history. It should be 
said that we do not have the complete copies of the last two of these Gospels, but only short quotes. The first Gospel we will look at in this group is called the Gospel of Thomas, which comes from the Nag Hammadi Library mentioned previously. Thomas is different than all the other Gospels we have looked at because it is simply a collection of the sayings of Jesus without any narrative framework. Therefore, it is called a sayings Gospel. The copies of the Gospel of Thomas we have now are all written in Egypt, Egyptian, but there are probably earlier Greek copies. It does not mention Jesus' crucifixion or his resurrection, or anything about any final judgment. Nor does it understand Jesus as the Messiah. About half of the passages we find in the Gospel of Thomas are also found in the Gospels in the New Testament. Most scholars think that the sayings in Thomas are taken from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then adopted for its own use. A few think that whoever wrote the Gospel of Thomas did not know the other Gospels in the New Testament, however, and therefore Thomas provides us with an independent source for the sayings of Jesus. If this is true, Thomas is a very important resource for studying the historical Jesus. Those who advocate that Thomas did not take these sayings from the New Testament, think it could have been written as early as 60. The majority of scholars who think Thomas took sayings from the New Testament Gospels think it was written between 120 and 150. Unless we find a copy of Thomas written in Greek that can be verified to an earlier date, the debate about this gospel will not be settled. How the next gospel, the Gospel of Peter, was found by a French archaeologist while excavating a monk's grave from an 8th or 9th century Egyptian graveyard where he discovered pages from the Gospel of Peter. The only part of Peter we have contains portions of Jesus' passion and resurrection story. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me as he is being crucified? In the Gospel of Peter, Jesus says, My power, my power, why have you forsaken me as he is being crucified? And then it says, When Jesus had said this, he was immediately taken up, suggesting that Jesus did not actually die. During the resurrection scene in the Gospel of Peter, Jesus is accompanied by two men walking out of the tomb, dressed in dazzling dazzling robes, who are supporting him as he walks out of the tomb and it says a cross followed him. The two men's heads reach to heaven, and Jesus' head reaches beyond heaven. And a voice comes from heaven, heaven asking, Did you visit those who have fallen asleep? And the cross answers, Yes. Once again, there is significant debate about the date of the Gospel of Peter. There are a very few who think it was written before the New Testament Gospels, probably in the 60s, and is independent of them. The vast majority of New Testament scholars think it was written after the New Testament Gospels were written, and that the Gospel of Peter embellished the New Testament stories of Jesus' death and resurrection, and was possibly written in the second or third centuries. The last gospel we will look at has the best story of how any early Christian writing was found. In 1958, 
a professor from Columbia University named Morton Smith, was on vacation and visited a Greek Orthodox monastery not far from Jerusalem to check out their library. As he is paging through an 18th century book containing the writings of a 2nd century Christian writer known as Clement of Alexandria, Egypt, He discovers a letter stuffed between the last page and the back cover. It is a 17th century edition of another 2nd century Christian writer named Ignatius of Antioch, Syria. In the letter Ignatius wrote, he mentions a gospel that has come to be known as the secret gospel of Mark. So in a book, there was a letter, and in the letter, it mentions and has a couple of long quotes of what is known today as the secret gospel of Mark. All of the writings that Morton Smith looked at were subsequently transferred from the monastery to the library of the Greek Orthodox Church in Jerusalem. And sometime after 1990, they disappeared. Clement says that when Peter died a martyr, Mark came to Alexandria, bringing both his own notes and those of Peter, from which Mark transferred into his former book, the Gospel of Mark, the things suitable to whatever makes for progress towards knowledge. Clement further says that Mark left an extended version, known today as the secret Gospel of Mark, to the church in Alexandria, where it even yet is most carefully guarded being read only to those who are being initiated into the great mysteries. Is this story true? We don't know. All three of these Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, and the secret Gospel of Mark, are highly controversial. So, as we wrap up, Here are some takeaways you may want to consider. First, the Gospels we have today come to us through a long process that was not written in stone, so to speak, till the heated and sometimes violent debate between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Reformers. It is true that many of the Gospels that circulated in early pre-Christianity fell out of use by the 4th and 5th centuries. But this is because they faded from popular use, not because they were systematically hunted down and destroyed. Second, early pre-Christianity was very diverse and the literature they developed reflects that diversity. We have looked at a few of the Gospels that were written. Some of them were used throughout the Roman Empire. Some of them were more regional specific. There were probably more Gospels circulating around and beyond the Mediterranean world. Our assumption, often unspoken, and unknown is that the early pre-Christian movement was concerned with historical reliability. They were not. Finally, we will look for the Jesus of history by using three tools of modern biblical interpretation, known in academic circles as the historical method. During this session, we have used the tool of source analysis or source criticism. Source analysis asks the question, 
What sources are reliable in the quest for the Jesus of history? During this session, we have looked at sources that questers do not use and controversial sources that a few scholars use. During our next session, we will look at the reliable sources and the sources within the sources.